Morning. Art Hostage here and we're going to do another live. Well, it's Saturday evening and I've had to come back because there's some interesting stories that have dropped since we spoke earlier today. Also, I am wallowing in the heat from the radiators because the boiler is fixed. And after we spoke, the heating was on for a good few hours. I then turned it off and went to bed. But my head was racing still on other stuff that I have to do. Paperwork, shall we say. Reference, fully reference paperwork. So I managed to, to grab a couple of hours. Um, and then got up. And have been addressing that. And I thought, well, okay. I've done about three pages, fully referenced and everything. And so what I'll do is I will go live. Because there was stories breaking. And literally, as we speak, one minute ago, the news has dropped that Litherland Road is blocked off after a big bang and ground shakes. Fire and police are at the scene. A road was blocked off following a big bang. Emergency services were called to Linacre Road in Litherland at around 7.40 p.m. on Saturday, the 27th, January the 27th. It follows reports of an explosion sound. When Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service arrived at the scene, they found a fire had been put out on arrival. A spokesperson for the force confirmed the source of the Big Bang was being investigated. Oh dear. But things like that, I mean, it could be a power thing, couldn't it? You know, one of them junction boxes, sometimes they do explode, don't they? <clears throat> so there's some interesting things that I'd like to bring you this evening. And we can start with... Um, just a few stories that are around. Man arrested after crashing a car following the pursuit as a quantity of stuff has been seized. That's down in Cork in Ireland. Another story that's doing the rounds, okay, uh, that hasn't been picked up by the mainstream media yet, um, so we have to take it with a pinch of salt, is the agency UNRWA. And it alleges that Humza gave that agency £750,000 from the IDF fund, which he had no right to use. That money has gone to, like Hamas and that, illegally given. And someone's claiming to have the freedom of information that proves it and details it. So we'll have to keep an eye on that. A man was slashed in the neck after an argument outside a nightclub. That was in Birkenhead. <clears throat> and now we turn our attention to the Netherlands, Holland, and gangland over there. All nine suspects deny involvement in the crime reporter's murder at the start of the trial. Now, what we're talking about now is we're talking about the murder of Peter De Vries, the reporter. At the start of the trial around the murder of Peter R. De Vries, all nine suspects denied having anything to do with the case or invo invoked their right to remain silent. And this happened um, 
in 2022, I think it was. It might have even been 2021, actually. The alleged gunman, Delgano G, said in a crowded court bunker in Amsterdam, I fully invoke my right to remain silent. Only suspect Ericsson O made a short statement. In a few short sentences, he denied any involvement in the DeVries murder. I didn't know who he was or that he was a famous person. O also denied having passed on information or being part of a criminal organisation. Furthermore, O claim not to know that De Vries was filmed after the attack. But when O was under oath as a witness and therefore not allowed to lie, he refused to confirm that statement, invoking his right to remain silent. <coughs> Excuse me. The substantive trial against the men suspected of involvement in the DeVries murder in July 2021 started on Tuesday. All suspects were present in court, as were the DeVries relatives. The court set eight days aside for the case. The sentencing demands will happen next week and the verdict is expected in June. The crime reporter was gunned down on the 6th of July 2021 on the Lange Leaders Warstrat in the centre of Amsterdam after appearing on RTL Boulevard. He succumbed to his, in his injuries nine days later. The two men who allegedly carried out the assassination Camille E. and Delano G. were arrested almost immediately after the attack. The Public Prosecution Service already demanded a life sentence against them in the summer of 2022. But the investigation was reopened shortly before the verdict after a new witness came forward. That is why part of the case is now being retried. Last year, some two and, one and a half million telegram ads for illegal substances in the Netherlands were sent out. Some two and a half million messages offering hard and soft and medicines for sale in the Netherlands were posted on telegram last year, according to a study. Analysis using an AI model. Criminals offer, it, offer their services in public chat groups with thousands of members. Some of the groups have been active for years, the broadcaster reports. Last year's two and a half million advertisements were posted in 21 chat groups focused on the sale of that and other items. Harder stuff like white and that were the most popular, but designer ones and soft were also widely available. The advertisements were often repeated in various groups. <clears throat> the providers, 9,900 in total, are active throughout the Netherlands. The newspaper spoke, um, sorry, um, the media or what was it? Yeah, the media have spoken to 13 providers. All have confirmed that they sell. Some specialise in certain types, only selling green, white or designer, but many advertise a complete range from everything. Most offer user quantities, but some over 800 accounts that offer larger amounts. Green by the kilo and pills by the thousand. The sellers consider Telegram an important advertising channel 
and an accessible way to acquire new customers, they told the broadcaster. After first contact, some sellers switched to other more secure chat apps like WhatsApp or Signal. The enormous number of advertisements creates the impression that Telegram hardly intervenes. But the messaging service told the media that that is not the case. Since our inception, we've modernised harmful messages, including the sale. <coughs> and they say they're trying to be proactive. The police noticed little of Telegram's active monitoring and enforcement. The platform typically ignores police requests for information about suspicious users and does little to clean up the platform itself. Right, but on the other hand, right, how about this one? Amsterdam Mayor says selling and using white should no longer be a criminal offence. The sale and use of white and other stuff should no longer be a punishable offence, says Amsterdam Mayor Femke Helsema in an interview in the FD. The mayor was quoted as saying, the fight against um, all of this stuff, the illegal stuff, is perverse and counterproductive. She wants the markets to be regulated to undermine the revenue model of unscrupulous criminals. The Justice Minister in the Netherlands, Dylan Yeslegots, responded by saying that how Seema's proposal is without merit. How Seema does not advocate for the rash legalisation of white, but for regulating the thing, the stuff. Her spokesman was quoted as saying, this will cut off the reason for criminals to take part in the trafficking. The spokesperson noted that this is already happening in the Dutch government's green cultivation pilot project, where green is legally supplied to coffee shops. It is not the first time that Hal Seymour has advocated for a new approach to the policy. For example, during a conference on organised crime in October 2022, she said that the war against narcotics is not working. She also expressed the hope that countries will consider the use differently and that an alternative strategy should be formulated. At the beginning of this month, the mayor warned in an opinion piece that the Netherlands is at risk of becoming a narco state. She was quoted as saying, we're proud of our health-led policy, but the rise in the global illicit trade means we need international solutions. She was also quoted as saying, she also recently spoke to city council members and it, she expects that related crime to the narcotics industry, right, and the rate of it is going to be going up in the next coming decades. She said there is a market for stimulant stuff and that hundreds of years of discouragement and attempts to quash such use of these things have achieved damn little. About 80% of the Dutch police capacity is spent on narcotics-related crime. In the Netherlands and Belgium, street prices for white have been exactly the same for years. So you can only conclude that the incredible amount of effort has had no effect on the market. It would be better to overthrow the criminal's revenue model instead of continuing a futile approach to, suspect, to suppress trafficking and use. I am part of a, she said she's part of a growing group of scientists and administrators who say that the international war 
against all that stuff is having a prefer such perverse perverse effects that we are now suffering more from it than from the from the things themselves. Let's see who we got. Is it Cherry? <coughs> Hello. Hello. Right, I don't know what you're talking about. Right, okay, I'm busy. So goodbye. Oh dear. It's obvious it's a young scouser from the voice trying to put on a fake voice and then when i said goodbye he just said f off dear oh dear last friday the international conference dealing with with that trade will take place um took place in the burst van burge in amsterdam the conference examined the crime and how the market can be regulated. And the mayor, she gave a keynote speech. But the current justice minister said, the regulation and sale of white and other things is not an issue. And she's only the caretake justice minister. She has succeeded Prime Minister Mark Rutt as the leader of the liberal right-wing political party, VVD. Yeltsin Gotts, right, she said, pointed out that the Netherlands, as an important transit country for the stuff, suffers enormously from organised crime and how it has creeped its way into other areas of life. We are dealing with major violent crimes with journalists, judges and lawyers who are threatened. That, this, that is my priority. According to the minister, regulation makes no sense as long as the Netherlands is the only country to do so. We know that most stuff leave our country, so does the money, she said. <clears throat> Hello, PD, how are you doing? So um, that just shows you, you see, and normally it takes um, um, very prominent politicians and people in authority in law enforcement, when they retire, they admit their whole career has been based on a false, ridiculous policy. Right, and also now, right, we got to remember that Raphael Imperiali is helping the Italian authorities hoping to get a low jail sentence like his compatriot, Edin Gakkenin, who got six years and is allowed to serve it in Bosnia, appeared via video link. And I think this might be to do with um, Rafael Imperiali. Spanish police catch Dutch most wanted suspect in syndicate money laundering case. Police in Spain apprehended a man they called the most wanted and dangerous criminal in the Netherlands. He was identified as Karim B, an alleged crime leader from Amsterdam, seen as a top rival to Ridouan Targi, who is currently on trial in the Netherlands. Spanish National Police announced the arrest of six individuals in total on Thursday as part of an investigation dating back to June 2018. The six people were taken into custody in Malaga and Melilla on initial accusations of laundering over six million euros in revenue earned from trafficking and suspicion of participating in a crime syndicate. <coughs> <coughs> Authorities said they froze assets, including three million euros in different bank accounts and 172 properties valued at a combined total 
of 50, 50, 50 million euros. Investigators also seized, seized 75,000 euros in cash, 10,000 euros in jewellery and two firearms. Police launched the investigation more than five years ago to combat the widespread trafficking of white. In Spain, this mainly focused on Malaga, Melilla and Marbella, as well as Barcelona. During the investigation, it was possible to verify the existence of a complex company based in Morocco, the Dominican Republic, the Netherlands, United Arab Emirates and Spain the police in Spain have said. The money laundering allegation is largely tied to what? The Hawala style system, Johnny Morrissey, where money and assets change hands in a complicated set of transactions with various brokers and fronts. Police said this was used to launder significant amounts of money which with which they subsequently acquired movable and immovable property. The stated target of the investigation was the Dutch person who was captured by the police. He was described as one of the leaders of the so-called Mokro Mafia, considered by the Netherlands as its most wanted and dangerous criminal. This man was alleged to have been a long-time trafficker in the Costa del Sol who brought together traffickers for a significant fee. The prime suspect is Karim B, whose brother Samir was assassinated in Marbella a decade ago. Karim is believed to have taken over his brother's role as the head of a large trafficking organisation. Gunman shot Samir Scarface B, as he walked out of the Monte Halicone shopping centre in Benahavis. He suffered multiple gunshot wounds to his head and his back and died at the scene. At the time, he was considered to be running a large operation based in the west side of Amsterdam while he remained in Spain. The Dutch news have reported, right, many, many outlets in, in the Netherlands have reported that Karen B was an assassination target named in encrypted chat messages sent by associates of Riddle and Targi, including Richard R, also known as El Rico, the Chilean, and also I Italian drug lord Raphael Imperiali. So if they couldn't kill him, they'd just grass him up. Investigators in the Netherlands in intercepted the messages and prosecutors have been using them in, a, in multiple trials. Imperiali recently began cooperating with authorities in Italy. Imperiali at one point shared information used in the chat communications where Karim B often worked out and a cafe he frequented. There he goes, crossed him up. Used in black and white, and there it is. Raphael Impar Imperiali at one point shared information with the authorities in Italy, right? Um, um, the chat communications about where Karim Bean often worked out the gym and a cafe he frequented. <laughs> See, honestly, they're all grassing each other up. That's at the top of the tree. That is at the top of the tree, right? Honestly. Right, Raphael Imperiali's grassed up car in B. There's no two ways about it. And this is all part of his, um, his hope that he can get, right, he's going to get probably eight years in Italy, serve probably four or five of them. <clears throat> huh. Do you know what I mean? Honestly. See, so all that myth and all that of oh, murder and all this carry on goes out the window. And then we got Hawala system, right? Johnny Morrissey could have thrown in a few bits as well. Right, honestly, all of them people at that level, right? It's the first one, right, to cut a deal gets the best deal. Right, and if you're the last holdout, right, you might get the worst deal. 
they've said to Johnny Morrissey, do you want to have a deal with authorities and grass everyone up? And he's gone, no, I'm staunch. They're going, all right then, John. Johnny, right, you can sit in jail for two or three years with no charges, right, and have a think about it. Because as we go forward, all your so-called compatriots and so-called staunch mates, right, are going to be grassing you up and grassing each other up. <clears throat> Right, so it just shows you. And, and this one, suspected Badger Beta turned alleged IRA volunteer accused of pub crawl intimidation. Spending less than 30 seconds in each venue, the men allegedly threatened we are the new, and we're here to clean up the bars. Oh, dear. This is the suspected Badger Baker turned, who has been accused of leading a pub crawl of intimidation around Dungiven. A Ballymena Magistrates Court on Thursday, 30-year-old Michael Stephen Conwell was charged with three offences arising from events at four pubs and St. Cancy's GAA Club in the village on January the 19th. Oh, he's nuts gone, isn't it? Oh, dear, he's only had a handgun. Oh, my goodness sake. <clears throat> and at the other end of the spectrum, ex-loyalist chief D. Coleman has been moved to an isolation wing because he's been dealing whilst inside. He's been moved to Mar Margabree's isolation wing amid claims he's dealing behind bars. The one-time leading loyalist who's awaiting trial with four other men on charges of kidnapping and attempted murder is understood to have been moved from his cell in the last week. And someone in Tyrrell's town at Eustace Rise, Dublin 15, has been, right, a business student has been caught with 120,000 euros worth of, of green, right, has been seized off him, right? His name is Michael uh, Ezebubi, E-Z-E-B-U-B-E, -E -E. Michael Ezebubi, 19, right, he's a business student. Was he on a business visa? 120,000 of green. And an update, right, from Finglis on what is allegedly going on there, right, allegedly, right, the Hennessy mob form an alliance with the South Finglis crew as revenge attack fears rise. There have also been reports that associates of Hennessy Senior have been attempting to source hand grenades for use in revenge attacks over his killing. Shooting victim Jason Hennessy Sr.'s mob are forming alliances with figures based in South Finglas as fears heighten of revenge attacks over his death in the wake of last Christmas Eve's brutal shooting. A volatile criminal with close links to slain Hennessy Sr. was observed at the, all afters, at the afters of last weekend's funeral in the company of a South Finglas base associate of deceased gunman Glenn O'Toole. Both individuals are understood to be united by a deep rooted hatred of the West Finglas base leader of the gang whom killer Tristan Sherry was linked to prior to carrying out the attack. Hitman Glenn O'Toole took his own life in Cloverhill prison in 2017 a week after he was arrested in possession of a firearm while on his way to kill the same gang leader. O'Toole had strong links to the Hutch crime gang while his target was aligned with the Kinahan cartel. <clears throat> Sources, right, um, have said that the image of O'Toole's associate paying his respect at the afters of 
Jason Hennessy Sr.'s funeral will be seen as an indication that Hennessy's criminal associates are actively securing alliances as tensions over his murder continue to mount. There have also been reports that associates of Hennessy Sr. have been attempting to source grenades for use in revenge attacks over his killing. The gang have also retained possession of the automatic rifle used by Tristan Sherry to carry out the attack in Brown Steakhouse that eventually claimed Hennessy Sr.'s life. The gang are continuing a hunt for the second gunman who joined Sherry in the initial stages of the attack, but fled when it became apparent the murder mission had gone pear-shaped and they are intent on establishing the identities of those who provided Sherry with logistical supports, including the weapon used on the night of the attack. Sherry died of his injuries he sustained after he was disarmed in Brown Steakhouse. A number of individuals have so far been brought before the courts to face charges in connection with his death. Earlier this week, a schoolboy who was facing a murder charge arising from the alleged involvement in Sherry's kill killing was refused bail after a High Court judge refused to release him, um, ruled to release him would create a substantial risk for the community and those around him. The 17 year old was previously remanded to Oberstown Detention Centre on January the 12th following a brief hearing. The Guardian objected to his bail application in the High Court. <clears throat> Mr Justice Tony Hunt, who had seen the CCTV evidence and heard defence pleas to release the boy, subjected to a range of conditions and parental su supervision, delivered his ruling on Wednesday. Refusing bail, Mr Justice Hunt said a gangland-type scenario sprang to mind and he found it incredible to contemplate that the boy could resume his life as before the incident. He said everyone, he said everybody around in an unconscious way would be expected to run the risks that now undoubtedly surround this young man, and to suggest, suggest otherwise was untenable. One part of the bail application focused on concerns that releasing him would endanger others and the community. Despite the application being heard in camera, meaning the public is excluded and there are media reporting restrictions put in place, Mr Justice Hunt said information may dribble out and was capable of be becoming well known. He said to suggest that releasing the teenager was free from risk was naive, naive in the extreme and the boy was on one side of a very dangerous situation which presents dangers which cannot be ignored. The court heard that when interviewed, the team told investigating officers he was in fear. The guardy said that the two guns involved in the incident had not been recovered and the second shooter is yet to be arrested. So, as you can see, things are still going on. A man in his 30s has been arrested after Gardy seized Brown worth 300,000 euros in a raid on a Dublin city apartment. Additionally, a quantity of white and items related to the street supply of illegal was seized during the operation. The man is currently being quizzed at a Garda station in the Dublin region following the seizure made by Gardy attached to the Bridewell Gardy station. Officers conducted a search of an apartment under warrant this morning in the Smithfield area and sees Brown worth in excess of 300,000 euros.
An adult male was arrested in connection with the seizure and is currently detained under Section 4 of the Criminal Justice Act 1984 at a Gardie station. The seized things will be sent for the forensics and the investigations are ongoing. Still no word from the Gardie about the £100,000 worth of green that was stolen from Carlo Gardie station or about the detective suspended in relation to the case. We're still not hearing anything, are we? George Galloway, the firebrand, is throwing his hat in the ring for the Rochdale by-election. The Labour Party right MP for Rochdale died suddenly, and so there could be an election, by-election in Rochdale as early as next month. And George Galloway's throwing himself in the mix. And there's footage come out of Dean Garforth, right, um, when he was on the National Crime Agency's Most Wanted list when he fled to Spain in 2020. They caught him on an e-bike, and there's the videos out on that. And there's a big story that's breaking right out of Liverpool, uh, but it's a national story, right? Um, major incident has been declared over the waterfront in Liverpool. A massive right fire. Crews from Merseyside Fire and Rescue Services were called to Fox Street in Vauxhall at 2.18pm on Saturday, January the 27th. A four-storey building was alight in a huge blaze with smoke visible from the Wirral. A major incident was declared. More than a dozen fire engines, several cranes were used to tackle the fire. No reports, thankfully, of any casualties. But it was huge. It was massive, great big fire. It was. Completely gutted this building. <clears throat> the gang who raided Jack Grealish's £5.6 million house and stole all these valuable jewellery and that, right? They haven't been caught and are suspected to have flown out the country anyway. They're meant to be South Americans who flew in for the, for the robbery and then fled. A priceless 18th century British painting stolen by mobsters is found in Utah by the FBI and returned to the family more than half a century later. A stolen 18th century British painting from 1784 was returned to its rightful owners after four, 54 years. The school mistress painted by John Opie was stolen from Dr. Earl Leroy Woods' home in Newark, New Jersey in 1969 by mobsters. The piece made its way to Florida, Utah and back to New Jersey where it was delivered to Leroy's son, Dr. Francis Ward, on January the 11th. It was purchased in the 1930s by Dr. Earl Leroy Wood for $7,500, but was later stolen from his home in Newark, New Jersey, in July 1969 by three convicted mobsters. In 1989, it resurfaced in a home in Hallandale, Florida, after an unidentified homeowner bought it with his new house. After he died in 2020, it was appraised and discovered as Uki, stolen. Special Agent Gary France then worked with the FBI in Salt Lake City and Newark to return the painting to Dr. Leroy's 96-year-old 96, 96 son, Dr. Francis Wood. In 
It definitely ranks in, you know, the top five cases I've worked on my career. It's his first art crime case. <clears throat> the painting is 40 by 50 inches. Dick picks a group of young boys being is instructed in Cornish a Cornish classroom, along with more children in the back with a dog. In the summer of 1969, three notorious mobsters, Gerald Fester, Gerald Donastag and Austin Castiglione, <clears throat> first broke into Earl Leroy Wood's house in search of his coin collection, but didn't succeed after they were thrown off by a burglar alarm and run away. Police and state senator at the time, guess his name, guess what the senator's name, police and state senator Anthony Imperiali then responded to the attempted robbery and was told about the valuable painting by the housekeeper. Just three weeks later, the same mobsters burglarised the New Jersey home again and escaped with the painting according to the FBI. During a trial for Donnerstag, his accomplice, Fester, testified and confessed to taking the artwork and revealed that he did so under the direction of the Senator Imperiali. <laughs> right back in 69. Right, there was a Senator in America, Senator Imperiali. Do you think it could be Raphael Imperiali's American uncle, great uncle? Senator Imperiali allegedly set up this art theft. <laughs> The accusations were never proven and Imperiali never faced charges, but France believes that the painting was transported by the Mafia to another mobster and stayed in their hands throughout the 1980s. The piece then resurfaced 20 years later after an unidentified man bought a home in Florida from Joseph Corvello Sr., an organised crime member who was indicted and convicted of RICO charges. The stolen piece came with the sound of the home, but the buyer said he was unaware of its long history or worth. It remained with him as he moved to his new home in St. George, Utah. The, the, the man then died in 2020, and the piece of art was then found a year later by a UK Utah-based accounting firm that he'd hired to liquidate his residence. Once it was appraised, it became clear that it, was, that, that it was stolen and handed over to the FBI. So I've already been clipped twice. <laughs> today right honestly some people right what just listen why do you have to clip you can do it if you want to it don't matter what else have we got coming up sadly a 48 year old man has been stabbed to death in milton Keynes. honestly it's every day every day in every way Mudman gang killer to only pay back 44,000 of a three million pound white fortune. Daniel Masher was hauled back before the court last week after previously being jailed for his encrochat involvement. <clears throat> And we're still seeing if we can get an update of what happened last night. Because there was a shooting at a house, shots fired, and I did it right. It was it was not point um not of a eight eighth of a mile, less than a mile between the two incidents last night. First of all, the shots fired at the house and forced their way in, right, and the bloke got um, right at um, uh, uh, his foot. 
And then, right, a couple of hours later, when the bloke walked in the pub, right, and um, right, ballied up, covered his face with, and stabbed someone. Less than a mile apart. So, I mean, whether that we, we'll find out in the coming days, whether there's um, correlation, you know, or connection with those. How did Leeds get on? I know Brighton, in Brighton, right? They were winning 2 0 at Sheffield United in the FA Cup fourth round, I think. Right, Bramall Lane. They're 2 0 up. All of a sudden, boom, right? By half time, it's 2 all. So, not to be deterred, right? Zerby gets them in the dressing room. Listen, pick your game up, boys. It's there to be won. They come out in the second half, right, and score three more. It ends up 5 2. How did Leeds get on? They were winning last time I looked. Zoe? Oh, that sounds good, doesn't it? Cup of tea with a bit of cream on it. Yeah, cream tea. I'm not too fussed with that. I like cream in my coffee. Demerara sugar. Yeah, I don't like sugar in tea or coffee it's too sickly when i was a kid we couldn't afford it so when i grew up and had my oh they drew you don't know oh. mind you after the result the other day zoe i mean you know at the end of the day it don't matter about the fa cup right you know they beat norwich and now they're up there fighting for second place in some ways it might help if they get knocked out And that sugar, yeah, I might try it, but you know what I'm like? I'll, I'll get addicted to it. I think, oh, that's sweet and nice, isn't it? I like chocolate. I've been eating a lot of Mars bars recently. Yeah, exactly. No, I understand, Zoe. I mean, if you want Leeds to be promoted, you want them free for all the, from all these other games. So I think you'll agree that it was legitimate of me to come back this evening, right, because of what the news stories that had dropped this afternoon on the internet and, you know, throughout different places. I'm sure that you would agree that it's been worth me coming back Saturday night live, 47 minutes you've had. We got nearly 100 people in here. Um, Lilong Me, yes, we did speak about Plastic Paddy's channel. Yes, and I explained, right, that what happened was um, under the new reused content guidelines, right, they found 50 different, five zero, 50 different videos where Plastic Paddy had breached the new guidelines on reused content, content because he called articles up on the screen for people to read along with him and was reading them verbatim. And giving credit and all that for where they were, but the big boys don't like it. So without any warning or whatever, he just lost his channel and it's gone. He's shut down. But he, I'm sure he'll be back. I'm sure he'll be back. But, I mean, this will affect a lot of people. And, and as I said at the time, my decision to have no bells and whistles on the channel no bringing up of videos, no bringing up of any kind of photographs and all that stuff, okay, um, seems to have given me some small relative protection. I was demonetized for reuse content, right? So it's only obviously stuff that I was talking about. So I'll just, I'll just adjust it now. And I go to the internet, read all the articles and come and present, uh, pre present to you, right, my own version of that. Massive result today in the cup, wasn't it? Maidstone United beat Ipswich at Portman Road. 
that's got to be a big upset, won't it? Six divisions right between them. Ipswich are smashing it in the championship, right? But they lost today, 2-1, I think, to Maidstone United. So, as I say, the thing is with YouTube, it's like the shifting sands. Things you can say and do that are fine, in six months, they might not be fine. And if they look back and say, oh, you know, I always thought if you brought in guidelines, you shouldn't be able to look back, right, at videos when the guidelines didn't apply, retrospectively. Because it's like saying, right, retrospectively, there's a new law. And anyone who did this before we brought the law in has broken the law. You, you know, it doesn't work retrospectively because the guidelines were different. And at the time, it met the guidelines. Now they're looking back and saying, oh, no, you don't meet the guidelines. Go, well, they weren't then. But they make it up as they go along. It's their sandpit and you have to play by their rules. So that's it, isn't it? You know, that's it. I'm going to go and get myself a bit of chocolate. Just, an, oh, oh, God. Right, hang on. Let me do it slowly. I don't want to rush. Oh. Where I had to make the gap so that the engineer could get to the um, boiler, it was the three drawers, and what the top drawer had all the cutlery in it. So the inner cutlery tray, I've had to now put in a cupboard and making space and that for all the stuff. Kinder Buono and Quavers, stop it, Zoe. I've got bags of Quavers out there, yellow ones, right, bags of them. Right, and I thought I was I was about to pick a packet up and bring them in here, but I thought it might be rude to sit here and eat a bag of quavers because they crunch a lot, don't they? I've just got a small Mars bar. What were the results then? Today's football. Let's go and have a look. Blimey, ain't been a good week for Fulham, has it? They lost at home in the FA Cup 2-0 to Newcastle. We had Ipswich Town 1, Maidstone Town, Maidstone United 2. Oh, sadly, Everton 1, Luton Town 2. But maybe Everton can now focus on the league, although I'm fearful that Everton are going to lose another 10 points. Leeds United 1, Plymouth 1, Leicester 3, Birmingham 0, Sheffield United 2, Brighton 5, Fulham 0, Newcastle 2.
That was very nice. Mmm. Nine countries are pausing the funding for the UNRWA over allegations that its staff were actively involved in the October the 7th attacks. An exceptionally rare Star Wars figure found in a loft has outstripped its estimate after attracting worldwide interest at auction. The Jawa character, complete with vinyl cape, is considered the holy grail of 1970s Star Wars figures, according to auctioneer Jonathan Tarod. It was snapped up by a UK collector for during the Hertfordshire sale. Now, how much do you think? It's only about three inches high, but it's in its original box. Pally toy. Never been opened. 19,500 pound. It was the second time in six months was to show off a sought after collectible. Back in July, it sold an identical Jawa figure for £26,670, including commission, after it was found in, by the same owner, along with memorabilia away in boxes. Each figure was estimated ten to 15000 the figure owner who worked for Marvel UK between 1974 and 1979 received a range of gifts from the UK toy company Palitoy during the promotion of Star Wars line in Marvel Comics. Only 10 to 15 examples of this figure type of figure were documented. Excalibur Auction said with the vinyl cake substituted for a cloth cake not long into the production. And he had two. I saw that Zoe, yeah, over at Joey Barton's, right? And he he, he was said, well, I'm not going to say anything. Um, not the little red one, no, it's like an orange cake, John. <clears throat> So anyway, right, this is your Saturday evening one. You've got double bubble. I've managed to get you another hour, squeeze another hour out for you. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'll be back tomorrow for Sunday uh, Roast or Sunday Live. Okay, um, and I, but I thought I'd bring you this one. Don't forget, hit the likes and subscribe. Buy me a coffee is pinned at the top. But please hit the likes. There's nearly 100 of you in here. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, we'll do it all again tomorrow. I hope you enjoyed this one. I've just brought you up to date with a lot of the things. In my own way, my own style, my own gravitas. And that's the way we got to be, isn't we? I've got to go and do the research and then just come to you and tell you what I found during the day.
So on that note, I'll speak to you soon. Good night, everyone. Zoe, John Hayworth, all the people, all the regulars in his shay. You never walk alone. Who else we got in here? Smashing the likes. House of Pain, PD, he's in as well. So I'll catch you all later, right? It's just a little one. I thought I'd update you with it all. So on that note, this is our hostage signing off.